Então, Isa, vamos começar? É, eu antes queria dizer para o Stanton Marlan que é um prazer recebê-lo e que, e que é, nós fizemos uma trilha sonora especial para esse evento, que consiste basicamente num grande artista da música popular brasileira, chamada Jorge Benjor, que em 1974 lançou um disco Os Alquimistas Estão Chegando, que se tornou uma peça clássica no repertório da música popular brasileira. Então, eu achei que era a trilha sonora fundamental para poder te receber, Stanton. É... Stanton Marlan é um dos mais importantes analistas junguianos do mundo contemporâneo, uma figura absolutamente fundamental dentro do campo da psicologia analítica, é alguém que, dentro dos estudos da alquimia, que tão caracterizam o pensamento junguiano, hoje ocupa um lugar que eu diria ao lado de Eduard Edinger, de Marie-Louise von Franz, né, como um dos grandes teóricos e pensadores da alquimia. Stan tem um livro chamado The Black Sun, que é, junto com Anatomia da Psique, do Edinger, e Alquimia, da von Franz, talvez um dos livros clássicos do pensamento junguiano sobre as questões alquímicas. O Stanton está para lançar dois novos livros que vão reunir os seus escritos alquímicos. Ele também publicou, editou esse livro Psicologias Arquetípicas, Reflexões em Honra de James Hillman, um livro que eu tive a oportunidade de participar, e daí vem o meu contato com o Stan, que ele me ajudou muito na escrita do meu artigo que fez parte desse livro. Então, é com muito prazer, com muita alegria, que eu gostaria de apresentar Stan Tomarlan para o público brasileiro, Stan, e que você se sinta plenamente confortável para falar conosco. Muito obrigado. O microfone dele está desligado, mano. Oi? Yes. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Sim. Yes? Oh, good. Uh, not sure I can live up to this uh, beautiful introduction. Thank you very much. And I'm very pleased to be uh, invited. I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Marcus uh, Intice for inviting me. Uh, like that. I guess what we should uh, say virtual Brazil to speak to your group. And um, I met Marcus many years ago in Pittsburgh at our conference honoring James Hillman. And I appreciate the educational opportunities he has supported over the years and the contributions he's made to my book, also Archetypal Psychologies. And Likewise, uh, to honor James Hillman. You know, the Brazilians have been amazing, it seems to me, in the vital reception of Jung and James Hillman and Wolfgang Giegerich. And it's interesting that the development of Jungian psychology in Brazil has been written about recently in the IAAP newsletter and the rich proliferation of Indian studies there is quite impressive. Um, and it's not surprising that the Journal of Analytical Psychology would be sponsoring an international congress in Brazil. Um, I'd also like to, um, I know some of you in Brazil, but not many, and I certainly would like to just uh, Uh, make an acknowledgement and extend my appreciation to Gustav Porcelos for his many contributions to Jungian studies, especially his work expanding the legacy of Hillman. 
and there there are many others. Um, I I finally want to express a deep gratefulness to my good friend and colleague uh, Leticia Capriati. I know Leticia to be a, an excellent Jungian analyst and supervisor and gifted teacher of Jung and archetypal psychology. And Leticia was the one who read many of my alchemical articles and persuaded me to bring them together and publish them in the form of a new book. They were scattered in many places and the book is now in press with Rutledge. Um, it's called C.G. Jung, The Alchemical Imagination, Passages into the Mysteries of Psyche and Soul. So this lecture today will lecture talk at living, not sure exactly what I'll include or not include, but part of it will be based on the introduction to the new book uh, because it summarizes some of my own reflections um, over many years on alchemy and partially from cobbled together from a, a talk uh, to Mind Matters, the Jungian Society at the Jung University of Toronto and some lectures at Duquesne University Alumni Society. So it's given me a chance to reflect uh, on my own ideas writing this, this book. And uh, it reminds me of the Mutus Liber, an old alchemical text that says, pray, read, read, read again, work and you shall find. And that's about what I've been doing with regard to my own work. It's interesting to go back and read your own papers from many, many years ago and to try to organize your thought and to see what the kind of daimonic thread is throughout your work and putting together this book has done that. So it's given me a chance to read and reread and rethink my work on alchemy it's a stimulating and relevatory process. Um, it's provided me with an opportunity to again, look at my work as a kind of a whole over time and to distill, examine, extract, coagulate, reopen, reimagine the ideas that are present in the book. In a sense, this material serves as a kind of prima materia a basic substance, which I hope will be of use to others if you choose to engage and read the book and dream the work onward. The dreaming the work onward is the most important part, you know, by taking it up and making what is useful to your own soul. Todas essas questões fiquem disponíveis para outras pessoas. Eu tenho lido... A introdução do que ele chama de Black, do, sol, do livro do Sol Negro. E também um outro artigo né, do, do Sol Negro, é, A Pedra Filosofal. Então, a noção dessa. Eu foquei muito na darkness e na luz da darkness itself. Mas, no final do livro, foi a luz da darkness que seemed to me to require further attention, the lumen natura, the uh, emergence from the darkness, what Hillman talks about shining through to this world from the underworld and to pay attention to that. And I hope to talk a little bit about that theme today. My contention is that the pursuit of truth and enlightenment in academic religious and spiritual traditions can surprisingly lead to despair and to profound darkness. And I'd like to begin with what the alchemists call the vinegar, which can help turn the soul from innocence toward a maturing depth. It's often forgotten. And so I would like to turn where I did at the beginning of the Black Sun and just read to you a couple of passages from Goethe's magnum opus Faust with its long lament in the first scene entitled Night. Jung said we can't read enough about Goethe. 
So in Faust, I see now to my regret, philosophy, law, medicine, and what's worse, theology, from end to end with diligence. Yet here I am, a wretched fool, and still no wiser than before. I've become a master and a doctor as well. And for nearly 10 years, I have led my young students a merry chase up and down in every which way and found we can't have certitude. This is too much for my heart to bear. And then Goethe goes on and says he gets no joy from anything either now, knows nothing that he thinks worthwhile and doesn't imagine that what he teaches would better mankind. And it continues, alas, I'm still confined to prison, a cursed musty hole of stone to which the sun's fair light itself dimly penetrates through the painted glass restricted by this great mass of books. The worms consume, the dust has covered, that up to the ceiling vault are interspersed with grimy papers. And then he addresses himself to us, the readers, with these words. And still you wonder why your heart is anxious and your breast constricted, why pain you cannot account for inhibits your vitality completely. You are surrounded not by the living world in which God placed mankind, but amid smoke and mustiness, only by bones of beasts and of the dead. Sustained by hope, imagination once soared boldly on her boundless flight. And now that our joys are wrecked in time's abyss, she is content to have a narrow scope. Deep in the heart of care, quickly makes her nest. There she engenders secret sorrows. And in that cradle, restless, destroys all quiet joy. You stone, why bear your teeth at me? Unless you say that once like mine, your addled brain sought buoyant light, but in its eagerness for truth, went wretchedly astray beneath the weight of darkness. For Faust, this is the beginning of a quest for vitality and joy in life. Feeling betrayed by the academic pursuits for truth, his laments, he, he laments the loss of imagination that renders life sterile, narrow, constricted, philosophical beginner vinegar begins its work and a desperate darkness surrounds him. <laughs> wrote, One cannot meditate enough about Faust. And in another context, in a letter to Arnold Kunzli, Jung too condemns the sterility of the academic. I don't believe in such futile philosophical undertakings, he says. I regret all speculations that exceed our capacities as sterile gripings and at the same time a pretext for covering up one's own infertility. Jung called this trying to jump over one's own head. For Jung, as for Goethe, such headiness can lead to a loss of imagination and away from what Faust called the living world and Husserl called the life world. Jung likewise indicated that traditional religion and the quick movement to Eastern traditions compensates for the sterile conditions of modern man. Now, I suppose that I begin with Faust because I too can identify with this 
original passion for academic study, for learning, for the pursuit of truth, but also with his lament, with his frustration, his disappointment, loss of imagination, and the ensuing darkness. I too have spent a long time in academia, in psychological and philosophical studies, and in religious and spiritual disciplines. And while I resonate with Goethe and Jung, I am not as critical of such intellectual pursuits, nor surprised that they can often lead to disappointment and darkness with which the alchemists, which with what the alchemists call the negredo. For the alchemists, the arrival at the negredo and darkness is an expected event, surprisingly even an achievement. A classical alchemical text, the Rosarium Philosophorum, remarks, when you see your matter go black, rejoice, for it is the beginning of the work. And Edward Edinger has observed that when such darkness occurs, the soul enters the gate of blackness and a journey to Hades begins with a descent to the land of the dead. For Edinger, as for Jung, this is an entrance into the depths of the individuation process. And in this spirit, I am also inspired by the alchemists, philosophers, psychologists, and analysts who see in darkness an opportunity for the rebirth of imagination and transformation. For Faust, the academics and philosophers had become like dead stones. They lost their vitality and living force, became placeholders and grave markers on bookshelves, reduced to slogans and cliches. At best, image carriers, on hold, promissory notes for perennial, a perennial ch chain of immortal ancestors, perhaps potencies awaiting some magical renewal, and the line continues on into our contemporary times. Ah, the great Parmenides and Heraclitus, Plato and Aristotle, Plotinus and Iamblichus, Porphyry and Ficino, the great saints, Augustine and Thomas, and the not so saintly heretics and hermeticists, whose name shall re remain a cult for now. And then the evil genius Descartes and the marvelous Copernican Kant, the great Hegel and the not so great Hegel, and Marx and the existentialists, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, and then the great Hegel again. My spirit soared with Husserl and Heidegger, ah, phenomenology and hermeneutics, back to the things themselves and to the heroic destruction of the history of ontology and the deconstruction of it all with Jacques Derrida and the further deconstruction of this world through the psychedelic experience with Timothy Leary and Ram Das and Ralph Metzner and breathing with Stanislav Grof. Thinking otherwise and face to face with Levinas on the couch with Freud, interminable, a very short session with fashionable Lacan, language all, symbolic order, the grand pastiche of contemporary sophistication, politicized and less than nothing with Zizek. And delusing it all, delusing it all in a thousand plateaus, territorializing and deterritorializing, following the rhizome, the thousand plateaus, and finally nothing to say with Wittgenstein, sitting quietly with Suzuki, Suzuki, 
and leaning toward the Buddhist void with Nargarjuna and seduced and aroused by Tantra. Then silence, darkness whispers, a call. Socrates heard his daimon, Faust Mephistopheles, Dante Virgil, and Jung Philemon, to name a few who found spirits of the dark that lead the way. But alas, I am no Socrates, Goethe, Dante, or Jung, nor imagined in any way I could approach the philosophical heights of the great philosophers. But I am aware of the spirits, voices of the night, the shadow world, pregnant with daimons, little people who would have their say, interrupting our narratives, opening what Frederick Schelling called the odyssey of the spirit that promises to take us further into our depths and out of them into the larger world. Such spirits call us in a way reminiscent of the calling Heidegger noted that is neither planned nor prepared for, that comes against one's expectation and at times against our will. A call that comes from beyond me, alien, a self that is no self, a darkness that is no darkness, but rather the light of darkness itself, the luminatura that must be invited in, in the spirit of Bacchus and Philemon, welcoming the gods. According to Jungian analyst, no, I don't know if he's a Jungian analyst, but Paul Bishop, a great writer, about Jung, the Romans called such figures totalitary deities, spirits, given to us by nature, what the Stoics called Deus internos, the God within. Schelling, like Jung, stressed the importance of contact with the eternal in the soul, and Jung famously remarked the decisive question for man, is he related to something infinite? or not? That is the telling question of his life. Perhaps it is only this that can respond to the alchemist Gerhard Dorn's challenge to transform yourself from dead stones into living philosophical ones. Come to terms with such spirits require a demonic engagement that allows for the unknown edges of experience to remain open. Such openings allow for a greater range of imagination for the fantastic that can decenter and destabilize our fixed positions and open us to the oddity of the spirit without which no deep understanding is possible. <clears throat> For Jung, this meant opening oneself to the depths of the unknown and yet not abandoning the precious gifts of intellectual differentiation of consciousness. Jung states in Psychology and Alchemy, 1944, it's rather a question of man's taking the place of the intellect, of man taking the place of the intellect not the man whom the dreamer imagines himself to be, but someone far more rounded and complete. This would mean assimilating all sorts of things into the sphere of his personality, which the dreamer still rejects as disagreeable and even impossible. For Jung, this was no easy task and required what he called a confrontation with a shadow with the perils, threats, and promises that often show themselves in the context of deep analytic work and process. Facing the shadow is one of the more important goals of Jungian analysis, a key aspect of the overall work. And coming to terms with the shadow means calling into question the illusions one clings to one most dearly about oneself which have been used to shore up our self-esteem and to maintain 
a sense of personal identity. Confronting the shadow and confronting one's illusions are understandably painful and at times dangerous moments in analysis. One danger is that the daimonic can become demonic. Stanley Diamond, the anthropologist, differentiated the demonic from the daimonic by noting that the demonic remains one-sided, frozen, locked into an irrevocable ontological conviction, personal and professional, political and religious, unconsciously certain. We worship ourselves or others, Freud or Jung, Hillman or Lacan, Democrat or Republican, God or devil, good or evil. Our biases are inner and outer, in yin or yang. Roderick Maine has noted, that where ambiguity and intensity are found together, as in the numinous, there is a high risk of splitting and projection. The demonic, unlike daimon, contains the seeds of its own redemption, the, the daimonic does, while fixed ontological convictions lead to fundamentalisms of every sort and silently invade and possess us. They press us toward premature clarity and philosophical closure. Our inspiration and ideas become gods in whose thrall we labor and work out our ends and in whose service we become warriors for their truths. We become purveyors of the absolute points of view and these truths may be rooted in biology or physics, in philosophy psychology, poetry, or even in the deconstruction of all points of view. Perhaps we cannot escape the gods. We think them necessary, not only in our inner, but also in our outer world, in our personal and professional lives, in our organizations, in our classrooms and universities, consulting rooms and private studies. In short, our demons inflate us but our shadows and often have roots in our deepest wounds. For me, reading alchemy has been helpful in all of this. It's become a demonic passion, a, a daimonic passion, a way of reading that pays careful attention to what is written, but also to the many voices of the unconscious. It is at once a reading and a listening. In a draft of the Red Book, Jung wrote, know that you attend yourself from what you read. You read as much into a book as out of it. In short, such reading is itself already an alchemical process, transforming the prima materia of what is written and allowing imagination to play a greater role in the formation of our ongoing understanding and perception of the cosmos. One might say that such a reading is personal, yet strangely other, that it both includes and surpasses the writer's intention and is carried forward by readers. It holds and grows beyond the subject-object divide, melding them together in a creative tandem that self and soul require. In effect, it activates a way of thinking, a dialectic that comes to terms with both young and the unconscious and inspires a continuing vitality of the alchemical imagination. The sequence of chapters in the book that I've worked on for me as a central alchemical themes that unfold and deepen our understanding of this process of alchemy and Jung psychology. And each chapter that I wrote for me was kind of like an alchemical experiment that repeated and extended and amplified my thoughts. My reflections began with Jung's discovery and encounter of alchemy as an opus divinum, as a as a psychological and symbolic art of transformation 
that provided a historical grounding for his psychology. <clears throat> this view of alchemy inspired many writers, both in and outside the Jungian tradition. And in my estimation, it was carried forward most prominently by the classical analyst Maria Louise von Franz and Edward Edinger, and uniquely imagined and revisioned by the analyst James Hillman and Wolfgang Giegerich. My own work has been inspired by all of them, but perhaps not surprisingly, by Edinger and Hillman, who were my analysts and teachers, and both of them made major contributions to the understanding the mystery and mysteries of alchemy opened up by Jung. Jung's profound engagement with the unconscious, Edinger's deep introversion and respect for the depths, Hilman's originality and iconoclastic fidelity to the image and imagination all played a role and helped animate my passion for a continuing exploration of the unconscious and the alchemical process and its goal, the Philosopher's Stone. Hillman raised the important question, what does the soul want? And he speaks to the importance of moving beyond any static conceptual rationalism to an ongoing inquiry into this question by a deep sustained contact with the unconscious, its objectivity, its animation, its eros, its mysteries. Such a contact requires a descent from the light of consciousness into the darkness of the unknown and unknowing. I have described this process as a soul-making one requiring an alchemical turning the light around as a deconstruction of the idea that light is traditionally understood is the best metaphor for consciousness. Moving beyond light into darkness can be explored in terms of facing the shadow and the negredo. The linking of light and darkness sets the stage for a fundamental recurring theme in both alchemy and Jungian psychology, namely the conjunctio oppositorum, the unity of opposites and the bringing together of light and darkness into an illuminated vision. For me, the engagement of consciousness with the unconscious reveals not simply a unity of opposites, but a multiplicity of intentions that challenge and oppose one another, as well as pull psyche toward unification, a fire in the stone, an alchemy of desire, when these tensions are held together, they catalyze a symbol-making process that produces complex archetypal images that exceed our rational categories. The intercourse and linking together of passionate intentionalities has alchemically been described as an erotics of desire, a hieros gamos, a sacred marriage that gives birth to what the Taoist alchemists call a spiritual embryo, an image of rebirth and renewal, which ultimately leads to an epiphany of the secret of the golden flower, an unfolding illumination, a symbol of wholeness and the goal of the work. The black sun, Sal Niger, is an analogous image in Western alchemy that links consciousness with the unconscious light with darkness into a paradoxical oneness whose shine is an expression of the lumen natura, the light of nature, the light of darkness itself. The alchemists considered it a prima materia, but like the golden flower, its illumination unfolds as a symbol, an indication of an ultima materia, the mysterious stone of the philosophers, and the psychologically as the self the goal of the alchemical work for Jung. As a symbol of the stone and the self, the black sun avoids the tendency to view the goal as a static whole. Its dynamism is that it carries darkness within itself as a deconstructive principle 
such that the self is also a non-self, a stone that is not a stone, a oneness that is not one, it is also other. There is no illumination without darkness, no wholeness without limit. It is also a oneness that does not require that differences subordinate themselves to a unifying principle. In fact, it breaks out of any idealism that situates all reality in some kind of subject of wholeness alone. Moving from the black sun to consider the philosopher's stone is not to leave the deconstructive principle of the black sun behind. The image is a complexio oppositorum and a mysterium canunctionis that not only resonates with the stone, but may well be considered another name for it. Hillman and Gigret have each made valuable contributions to our psychological understanding of the philosopher's stone. Both are complex thinkers, and in some way, their view overlaps. There is yet critical differences between them. Both of them emphasize the importance of the link between image and thought, but each privileges one side of the syzygy over the other. For Hillman, as for Jung, image remains fundamental, while for Gigerich, thought is essential and goes dialectically beyond images and imagination. Both image and thought are important aspects of any vital notion of the philosopher's stone. <clears throat> For Gigerich, the imaginal requires a continuing negative interiorization. But just as he negates the literal residues of the imaginal, Hillman imagines um, Hillman's imaginal psychology continues to give flesh to this unseen. Salve coagula, say the alchemists. In my work, I have found value in both perspectives, but ultimately I find myself critical of the idea that thought surpasses images and imaginations on the way to what Gigerich calls psychology proper and the absolute. My perspective distilled from the work of Jung and Hillman and others is that thought and image continually give rise to one another, give birth to one another. Just as the image gives rise to thought, so thought gives rise to the image and to the creative imagination. Perhaps in the end, both thought and image may best be thought of in a variety of ways as an alchemical circulatio, as a monstrous conjunctio, and as a trembling ground of poetic undecidables. All of the above might be thought imaged as metaphors that attempt to speak the unspeakable, the unknown, the paradoxical, because we can think, imagine, the stone as both rational and non-rational, known and unknown, unity and diversity, order and discord, cosmos and chaos. And I've added the word chaosmos to the multiple names for the stone, a term used by James Joyce to describe this structure in his alchemically relevant book, Finnegan's Wake, chaosmos bringing together order and disorder, disorder and order. As Jung moved toward the idea of a psychology of alchemy and away from a literal material practice, he recognized the importance of the spiritual philosophy for understanding it and its goal, the philosopher's stone. For Jung, it was important that our spiritual and psychological understanding of alchemy did not degrade or leave matter or nature behind. The early spiritual alchemists considered many important aspects of the psyche to be vulgar and filth, while Jung and Hillman held them to be indispensable 
for the alchemical recipes and practice. As the alchemists insisted, the gold of possibility lies in the ugly, in the waste of what is right at hand. The alchemical kaput mortem, the dross of life, is part of the shadow of what Gigrish calls psychology proper. While Gigrich's notion of sublimation, ex sublation expresses itself in truth and the logical life of the soul, Jung's idea of the transcendent function creatively produces symbols and imaginal results not reducible to logos. My own view, following from Jung and Hillman and archetypal psychology, is that what is expressed by the transcendent function is a dark illumination that is other than the truth of logical light and that produces a dynamically charged image which moves in a mercurial, erotic, and imaginal play between knowing and unknowing. For Robert Romanishan, I guess who you'll be hearing later on in your series, it's the voice of things that is best served by the language of metaphor and imagination which inhibits neither the brilliance of the day nor the darkness of the night, <clears throat> but speaks simultaneously in light and shadow. Hillman, like Jung, championed the importance of images and the imagination as fundamental and advocated for this position with his notion of sticking to the image, a position which Gigerish criticizes. And yet, Strangely, Hillman, too, criticizes himself for being stuck in the image and also recognizes the need of the soul to go beyond itself, moving skyward toward what he called the Azure Vault. But for Hillman, this move is not simply the logic of the spirit. Rather, it links soul and spirit in a vast bluing, an imaginal vivifying of psyche, that does not leave images behind, but instead expands them in what he calls a living metaphysics, a cosmological praxis that expresses itself in polydiadic cosmos, a pluralistic vision that has always been a mark of archetypal psychology's contribution to a revision psychology. Although Hillman would deny that this vision is religious or mystical, he recognizes it as bordering on the transcendent and displaying a sense of inexpressible sanctity that takes place in a magical atmosphere. As noted earlier in his introduction, Jung did not see alchemy as religious, uh, did, did see alchemy as a religious, if not mystical philosophy, as an opus to venom, path of transformation. It is interesting then to consider the relationship between psychoanalysis, alchemy, and the mystical traditions. For some, a surprising connection between disciplines that seem to be as far apart as science and religion. For Jung, the connection is evident, but this recognition was not limited to him. It was also present in the early work of Herbert Silber and Jacques Lacan, and other analysts as well, as many philosophers and mystical theologians. In rereading my own work, I have noticed that many of the thinkers and systems transformation I have studied describe a phenomenological process and a path that leads to the goals of these independent and yet overlapping approaches. A common and recurring element of these ideas is the importance of an initiation in the form of negation, deconstruction, and an intimate link between this negation and some form of creative emergence. Symbolic images and archetypal patterns move the soul into greater depths and reflect the goal of the work. <clears throat> in my judgment, the experiences of negation and their outcomes at best, do not lend themselves to any static ontological fixity, but rather demonstrate an ongoing vital process, which in the light of analysis does not erase mystery, but activates and enlivens it 
making it a significant part of psychological and spiritual transformation. The stone does not allow itself to be held in meaning, says David Miller. It does not yield to understanding. For me, mystery, imagination, and wonder are integral parts of psychological and analytic work, which keep it alive, the perennial play between knowing and knowing. It is better that one accept each pull, both reason and unreason, both good and evil, into one's life experience and worldview. And only then can one experience the differentiated wholeness that will give rise to an individuated self. At the end of Psychology and Alchemy, Jung wrote, when dealing with alchemical processes, we're dealing with life processes, which on account of their numinous character, have from time immemorial provided the, strong incentive, the strongest incentive for the formation of symbols. These processes are steeped in mystery. They pose riddles with which the human mind will long wrestle for a solution, and perhaps in vain. For in the last analysis, it is exceedingly doubtful whether human reason is a suitable instrument for this purpose. Not for nothing did alchemy style itself an art, a field, and rightly so. It was concerned with a creative process that can truly be grasped only by experience and that the intellect may give it names. The alchemists themselves warned us, rend the books, lest your hearts be rent asunder. And this despite their insistence on study. Experience and not books is what leads to understanding. In the end, my book, I hope, will best be understood by going beyond it, reading it, taking up its ideas to the extent that they're relevant to your own experience and life of soul. The Mutus Libra was called a silent or mute book. It is a book of mysteries, of secrets, aimed at creating the Philosopher's Stone, which is produced by the work of the alchemists with his Sora Mystica. Together, the alchemist and his mystical sister hold the secret <clears throat> within the intimate implications of an opus erotica. What the soul wants, Hillman concludes, is a rethinking of itself with body and world, which produces a resurrection no. in beauty and pleasure, a return to the world, beautiful and glad, that heralds an alchemical rebedo, a vital reddening of life beyond abstract psychological life. Hillman, the beauty of the imagination, only makes sense if its desirousness is felt as a libidinal, aphroditic reality, a touch of Venus, and like Voluptus, the goddess of sensual pleasure and delight. Once one goes beyond the limit of intellect alone, negates it, and turns to a deeper experience, it opens, in a, it opens a potential for abundant vitality, the vitality that Faust lost, and which Lacan noticed begins in a trickle and ends with a blaze of petrol. Lacan's passionate metaphor speaks to the heat necessary for the transformative process. But for Hillman, even Lacan's idea of jouissance falls short, describing the libidinal erotic sapphire. For Hillman, the libido is a cosmic erotic dynamic that permeates the world. It loves the world of matter. Hillman's aphroditic language drips with lust from the metabolic heats of the body that stew and digest and melt the loins. As fire licks and clings to the logs, it burns so passionate, clings to the bodies of life. Like the claws of a cat, the paws of a lion, sulfuric fire attracts to objects of its desire or attaches itself to its own desire. Intense internal heat as the moment of fertility. 
initially the heat of passion strives to possess life, the anima, as soul. But life cannot be possessed by our grasp. We cannot own the objects of our lust without diminishing them or ourselves. Hillman traces the notion of the libido to a word cluster that includes to make liquid, melt, to love, as well as to free. Release and freeing the passion to possess implies a letting go of the self as well. I believe this is what Hillman means by the psychotherapeutic cure of me. Oddly, such a release does not diminish passion, but increases, tinctures, matures it through considerable pain and struggle, returning the adept anew to the world of matter and nature. The return allows one to see in matter a display, an inner light, an inner lichtkeit, which illuminates the independence of the other. The stone ripens in the fire and in the glow of the alchemical imagination. For the alchemist, the art of fire is central to the opus. Just as a psychoanalysis of fire is fundamental to the analytic transformation, fire meets itself and the passions of mind meets the passions of the body and world. The alchemist must be able to fight fire with fire, says Hellman, using his own fire to operate upon the fires which he is opening and operating. Working the fire by means of fire, the art of fire is the key to alchemy, means learning how to warm, excite, enthuse, ignite, inspire the material at hand. And it is my hope that reading this book will ignite a spark in its readers and encourage them to pay attention to the intensity of fire. So I've begun with Faust, and I'd like to end with a poem <clears throat> from Theodore Rothke entitled In a Dark Time. In a dark time, the eye begins to see. I meet my shadow in a deepening shade. I hear my echo in an echoing wood, a lord of nature weeping to a tree. I live between the heron and the wren, beasts of the hill and serpents of the den. What's madness but nobility of soul at odds with circumstance? The day's on fire. I know the purity of pure despair, my shadow pinned against the sweating wall. That place among the rocks, is it a cave or a winding path? The edge is what I have, a steady storm of correspondences, a night flowing with birds, a ragged moon, and in the broad day, the midnight comes again. A man goes far to find out what he is, death of the self in a long, tearless night, all natural shapes blazing on natural light. Dark, dark my light, darker my desire, my soul like some heat-maddened summer fly keeps buzzing at a sill, which I is I, a fallen man I climb out of my fear. The mind enters itself, and God the mind, and one is one, free in the tearing wind. So I'll stop with that, and hope we can open to whatever questions or thoughts others might have, and uh, leave it with that. Muito obrigado, Stan, pela, pela fala, pela palestra, pelo longo percurso que nós vamos esperar ansiosamente para poder ler com mais calma nos seus próximos livros. É, vamos fazer o seguinte, pessoal, quem tiver perguntas, coloca o um nome no chat, eu chamo e as pessoas fazem as perguntas, tá? Eu queria começar o debate é, com duas perguntas para o Stan. Isa, está me ouvindo? 
Tá, então vamos lá. Primeira pergunta, Stan. É, ao ler o seu livro Black Sun, yes. é, sempre me fica uma dúvida yes. clínica. A dúvida diz respeito a pensar se essa posição da Nigredo ou do Black Sun é um estágio, é uma posição que pode ser provocada pela, pela intervenção, pela atuação do analista ou não? Ou seja, é, esse estágio psíquico da Nigredo, da Black, do Black Sun, são condições naturais da psique que a psique lentamente irá se desdobrar e chegar nela, ou é necessário que o analista atue sobre para provocar o Black Sun? Essa é uma primeira pergunta. A segunda questão. Yes. It's a wonderful segunda question. Questão. Yes. Segun, segunda It's questão. It's very interesting. Um, oh, two. Okay. <risos> é, você acha possível pensarmos... Ok, ok, ok. Ok. okay. Ok, you can okay. answer the first one. Ok. So, yes, I mean, it's, it's really an interesting question that I've been working on, actually, in another book that I'm working on now and in a paper that I'm writing called From the Red Book to the Alchemical Imagination to the Reddening of Psychology. And in that book, one of the things that comes up is the question of whether or not, and, and it's actually taken up by Sham Dasani and Hillman in their dialogue about the Red Book and the lament. <coughs> and um, one of the interesting questions is, does the primordial psyche itself shape the soul? Or does that primordial prima materia requires the analyst or the alchemist to work it in such a way that it moves from the prima materia to the ultimate material. Is it a natural process or does that process require some kind of participation? <clears throat> I believe both are true in some way, um, but I do think that participation with the prima materia is what the alchemists and analysts offer us. But how that participation happens seems to me extremely important. Um, in the dialogue that Hillman and Shantasani and others have is with the question of the translation from the primordial material to what Jung calls the upper air or to make the unconscious conscious. If you do that in a way that sterilizes it or minimizes it or loses its numinous quality or leaves the images behind as and says, then you have Uh, a drying out of the potency of the process. And so the work of analysis as the work of alchemy requires, I think, a way of engaging with the materia that leads it down into the depths of its original potency and numinosity. And in that, the transformative energy is catalyzed. And the analyst, the alchemist, can help guide that but it also comes from the core of the archetypal energy. So I believe that the dark sun and when we enter the negredo comes as a natural process, but analysts <clears throat> can get in the way of that process by, de by sometimes not giving room for one to face the shadow, to go deep into the archetypal parts of the depression, to go down to the depths, If they interfere with that, shut it off, medicate it sometimes. Um, not that I am against medication, but if it is stopped in any way by the process of the analytic intervention, then it can be interrupted and minimized, and the full potency of the process of psyche uh, does not show itself. 
So I think I'll stop with that. Ok, ok. Uma segunda questão e a gente abre para o público, tá? É, você acha que o tema da alquimia dentro do campo dos estudos junguianos, hoje, ele poderia ser dividido em três grupos? Por exemplo, um primeiro grupo composto por Eduard Edinger e Von Franz, um segundo grupo pelo James Hillman e um terceiro agora pelo Wolfgang Igris. E aonde, nesses grupos, o seu trabalho se localizaria? Yes. I, I wrote a paper for uh, Reynos Papadopoulos's book yeah. on uh, Jungian psychology. I forget the title offhand, but I kind of lay out the kind of alchemical uh, uh, development in Jungian thinking. And I did follow such a thing. I think the classical analysts like von Franz and Enger do a wonderful job of um, helping to helping us to understand Jung better, and in addition to make contributions of their own in a classical way. And so there is a classical psychological approach to alchemy. Hillman turned that around a little bit by moving from a psychology of alchemy or a translation of alchemy into psychology, into what he called not a psychology of alchemy, but an alchemical psychology by preserving the language of alchemy And more than just the language, but the but the alchemical imagination, so that it's not simply translated into the spirit of our time, so to speak, um, but carries that potency that I was talking about in alchemical psychology. Gigerish takes off from Hillman in, in a particular direction and is a very smart thinker, uh, largely based, I think, still in Hegel, even though he would claim It's different than Hegel. And I believe he has a lot of very good insights into alchemy and into Jungian psychology and has, of course, the, the, the uh, discipline of interiority group that is working his material and producing some very interesting stuff. But as I said in my reflections, uh, my own tendency is to see uh, the development that uh, intrigues me Uh, beginning really and sticking with more, um, you know, with Hillman's alchemical psychology and following it from there, as well as the recognition that for me, um, um, the recognition for me is that we're not really, in my mind, in a post-Jungian period simply. We're also in a pre-Jungian period. We still have a lot of Jung to learn. Classical Jung isn't totally assimilated by any means. And in many ways, Hillman continues to work that process, express it differently, get to some of the core beliefs of Jung, animate them, bring his own spirit to bear, and is itself, I think, primarily uh, the inspiration that um, I follow, both classical Jung and Archetypal psychology. Obrigado. A Letícia Capriotti tem uma pergunta. Letícia, por favor, prazer te ver aqui também, Letícia. Sinta-se bem-vinda. É para eu falar, Marco? Isso. Você, você vai fala? ler? Não, por você, favor. por favor, claro. Tá bom. É, queria dizer que é sempre uma alegria, um grande prazer ouvir o Stan falar, que maravilha tê-lo aqui no Brasil, né? É, eu queria pedir para ele falar um pouquinho sobre as próximas publicações, né? Ele mencionou no comecinho essa compilação de, de artigos dele sobre alquimia, é, mas eu sei que tem ideia de lançar um livro também sobre os sonhos, e, e sobre este grande livro que ele está escrevendo, que é uma continuação ao Black Sun, eu sei que ele já mencionou várias partes aí do que vai ser publicado, mas talvez falar um pouquinho da trajetória, de como é sair do Black Sun e ir para este novo livro. Uh, 
uh, I'm sorry that when that came through, it came through in both languages at once, and I couldn't understand what was being said. Não tem problema, eu posso repetir. É melhor eu falar em português ou em inglês? Uh, it's coming through in Portuguese. I, I, I don't understand. I'm sorry. So perhaps I can speak in English. Can you can you um, hear me? I can. I, yes, I can hear you. I can hear okay. you now. Okay, good. I, I began saying that it's always a great uh, pleasure okay. to speak, and it's great to have you here in Brazil. And uh, I'd like uh, for you to talk a bit about your next um, publications. I know you mentioned in the beginning this um, book on alchemy you, you're just about to publish, that it's the compilation of different uh, papers. And I know there is the idea of uh, publishing something similar uh, uh, related to dreams. And I know you already mentioned a lot about what's going to be your next book. But perhaps you could uh, tell the audience about the, the the process of coming from the Black Sun to the next uh, idea that's going to be in the book. Yes. Um, well, yes. I mean, I'm working on probably too many things at once. Uh, I think that uh, the papers book is now completed and in publication. Um, I have a contract for a book on uh, dreams, which interests me a great deal and has a lot of examples of dreams and papers that I've published, but also new stuff on dream work. Um, but uh, the book that I'm moving to now is a follow-up to The Black Sun. And I wrote a paper for spring called From the Black Sun to the Philosopher's Stone, some of which I've talked about. Uh, but the new book, um, you know, is taking me back into this question of illumination, uh, just what illumination means. And um, maybe I could, there's a lot to say about that, but one of the things that's interesting, I think that might, might be interesting to you, is that this idea of negation that Gigurish talks about and that I see as an important aspect of illumination is something that for Jung was present in the idea of the defeat of the ego as a victory for the self. So the negation or the negredo of the, of the ego, Jung saw as a victory, a victory that emerges consistently in some kind of illumination or symbolic imagistic process. For Hillman, the negation is brought about by the alchemical stone that wounds and defeats all human effort, leading to this psychotherapeutic cure of me. So you get the defeat of the ego as a victory for the self, and you get a cure of me and Hillman. In Giedrich, the negativity is expressed by a cut, an absolute negative interiority which is necessary for reaching the highest level of soul and absolute truth. But that's a different process. And I'll be writing more about that because we've had a lot of exchanges. Gigrick and I uh, have written back and forth quite a bit and there's still more, I think, to be said. In alchemy, the negredo opens up the albedo. Um, uh, it moves from salve to coagula. For Lacan, castration and lack are catalysts for ecstasy and jouissance. For Deleuze and Guattari, deterritorialization leads to re-territorialization, re you know, a, a deconstruction and a reconstruction, a following of the rhizome. In Hindu philosophy of the Veda Vedanta and Jnana Yoga, neti neti, not this, not that is a meditative essential form that leads to satchitananda, consciousness, truth, and bliss. So the Hindu sages, it's important that this negation leads to a negation that has to itself be negated, the outcome of which is greater bliss and the essence of ananda, or pleasure. In the practice of Madhyamika Buddhism, it requires a fourfold logic, a negation leading to shunyata, the void, 
But then for Buddhism, the void has to be voided. And then it throws you back into samsara, into the round of images and life again. As I said, like Kilman's work gives flesh to the, to the negation. So there's a return, the circularity of life. Samsara and illusion and nirvana are one. An aphroditic or negative theology, uh, apathet- apathetic or negative theology, the names of God are all negated, but they lead to a divine darkness and a divine light. And for Meister Eckhart, spiritual poverty or emptying out negation of our pride leads to an, an a wandering joy. So I'll be writing about these movements from negation and negredo to illumination in a lot of different traditions and a lot of different analytical cases and in active imagination. I know that Hillman talks about the fiction of the case history and speaks of the importance of literature and other ways of rendering the psychic reality. But for me, it's also true that studies of active imagination in the analytic process are extremely illuminating. And I have some interesting cases of the volcanic process and the volcano goddess that will be part of the of the new book as she teaches the alchemist's notion of heat and what one does with the heat and humidity of the soul as a transformation process. So those are a few things just sort of off the top, you know, that are lists of things that I'll be going into as the work continues. It's a mouthful. <laughs> é, André Dantas, de Fortaleza, nosso amigo, quer fazer uma pergunta. André, por favor. Yes. André? É, bom dia a todos. Eu gostaria de perguntar para ele ele chama atenção para a ausência da coagulácio na abordagem dialética do Gigres. Eu queria que ele falasse da importância dessa operação, a operação da coagulação alquímica, para a prática clínica dele, e para uma abordagem que não suspende a imaginação, né, a, a, a imaginação do super, Supervision? Prática da operação... Oi. Oi. Tá ok. O senhor chama atenção para a ausência da coagulação, da operação alquímica da coagulação, na abordagem dialética do Gigres, do Wolfgang Gigres. Eu gostaria de saber qual a importância dessa operação, da operação alquímica da coagulação, na prática clínica dele e para uma abordagem, né, que é a abordagem que não suspende a imaginação, não suspende a imaginativa no espírito do ânus, como é o caso da prática do Gigres. Deu para entender? Yes. Why, why that's important for Gigeric? Um, you know, I... I'm not sure how well I can answer that question or not. Let me talk a little bit about how I hear it and think about it. Um, Gigrick's work is a wonderful work of deconstruction and negation. Absolute negative interiority is a dissolution process, a deep salutio process that moves the dialectic of psyche to a higher level of logos and thinking. And in that process, there's a progressivist developmentalist version of what psyche is about. And it's a version that in my mind leads toward what he calls psychology proper and animus psychology. And it values intellect and logic And the coagulatio 
in Hegel's dialectic and in Gigerish is, is carried by the historical process, which remains part of the dialectic, but the work always goes toward a logical absolute. And for me, that ultimately separates out the everyday naturalistic ego life of the patient, which is transcended. And the death of the ego process is important, but I believe that that separation from the imaginal life and from the bodily life goes too far and leaves something in the unconscious. It leaves a residue at the bottom of the flask of life. It leaves a kaput mortem. I wrote a paper about it. And that kaput mortem is seen as trash, as not as valuable, but ultimately is a core of something that sparks. It's the trash that is essential for illumination. And so for me, um, I'm drawn back to the imagistic process and the coagulation of images. And even images for Hillman shouldn't be seen simply as objects. They're ways of seeing perceptions as well as objectifications. So there's a lot more to be worked out, I think, between the psychologies of Giegrich and Hillman um, and the role of the question of what the coagulatio means for Giegrich is an important question. Perhaps he would have to answer better than I could. But for me, um, uh, I see him as leaving something essential behind. Ok. Perguntas? Quem, quem gostaria de fazer mais uma questão, levantar mais uma questão? É, Isa, é, fazer uma pergunta para ele. É, o Stan, você acha que quando você menciona a ideia é, de, um, de uma de um obscurecimento da luz da consciência em relação a, 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 uma, a uma luminosidade da escuridão, a gente... Tudo bem, Isa? Por aí? A gente poderia aproximar... Caralho ruim, que esse, eu A gente poderia aproximar eu esse movimento... André, André, André... Uh, I'm sorry. A gente poderia aproximar esse movimento oh, como okay. <risos> esse movimento como alguma coisa próximo ao que a gente conhece como movimento pós-moderno de descentramento do eu, de dissolução das metas narrativas, já que ele menciona vários autores pós-modernos como Deleuze, Lacan, Derrida. Você acha que a alquimia, a alquimia poderia ser pensada como um método pós-moderno? I think that uh, I've certainly been influenced by postmodernism, and postmodernism certainly emphasizes the process of deconstruction and negation. Um, Uh, critique of classical uh, visions of uh, literalism and things like that. Uh, but I would say that for me, uh, there's a strange mixture of postmodern and pre-modern and maybe modern that they blend together for me in a way that doesn't get, um, uh, doesn't surpass um, something keeps calling back uh, uh, me, 
pulling back my soul from the deconstructive process to some core mystery that remains consistent and continues to open up and illuminate that I'm trying to describe. So there might be a way that I would see my work as postmodern, but also as a continuing exploration of the classical um, and maybe in some tension between them. Again, like I said, I'm not sure that we've become post-Jungian, uh, only partly. Um, for me, Jung still remains uh, a guiding light. Um, I read Memories, Dreams, Reflections over and over again and continue to learn from Jung. And even though that may not yet be the final version of that book that we'll see, there's an awful lot in it that continues to vitalize my understanding and transform the way that I think and contribute to my own work. Tá ótimo. André, vamos lá? André? Vamos lá. Vou falar aqui devagar para facilitar a tradução. É... Como, como o senhor combina a noção de resíduo inassimilável de caput morto com a noção alquímica de que a operação começa quando toda a matéria, a prima matéria, é dissolvida no mercúrio? I'm Algo sorry, que escapa essa dissolução? Algo que escapa a dissolução no mercúrio? Há algum tipo de resíduo inassimilável que escapa a dissolução da prima matéria no mercúrio alquímico? Ok. Tá ok. Acho que fica mais fácil. Yes. Yes. Well, I don't know that it escapes because to talk about escapes literalizes the notion of the completion. I think Mercurius is always both spirit and matter. You know, he's always defined as something that isn't uh, put into liquid or solid form. In other words, we tend to think of a complete dissolution as somehow literally all liquid. But the complete solution is not simply liquid or matter, it's both. And so that's the oddity of the mystery. You know, we tend to want to look at oneness or wholeness or completeness or the stone as something that dissolves everything. And it does, but it doesn't. So that's the mystery of it. And I think whenever we get, as I was talking about, we come up with what seems to be a kind of ontological conviction that the alchemists say it's all dissolved in mercury. But what does that ultimately mean? There's a mystery about who Mercurius is and what Mercurius is. Is Mercurius all liquid mercury or is it also a solid of some kind? And the residue might be a pull of the archetype that contains what gets left out when we ontologize or literalize the mystery of liquid. When we fix it into a certain idea, we might miss something at the bottom of the flask. 
And so sometimes that's the filth that people reject. The early alchemists talked a lot about the spirit and the albedo. For instance, Gigrish makes an interesting argument for the albedo and why the reddening may not be as so important as the albedo. But for me, the reddening includes the filth. It includes the, the reddening. It includes the mystery. It includes the wonder. And for Wolfgang, a lot of times he tries to go beyond wonder and mystery. The, the logo solves it. And uh, seeing alchemy that way doesn't capture its full mystery. Something like that. É, Stan, tá. Stan, yes. você acha que a alquimia poderia ser uma chave de interpretação metafórica para esse atual momento que nós estamos vivendo, de Covid-19, de pandemia? A alquimia, o olhar alquímico, poderia nos ajudar a construir um sentido a mais nesses fenômenos atuais de pandemia? Yes. Yes, indeed. Uh, I mean, I think it certainly does bring us into um, a darkness, uh, an isolation, a process, um, and looking at it in an alchemical way, just looking at, just like looking at the Negredo in an alchemical way, gives us a way of living it with soul, to see it as part of a soulful process. And, uh, with all of its horror and all of its awfulness. Uh, it also is strange how it cleans the environment. It shows us things about life that hit us in the face in ways that otherwise we might not experience. So yes, but I think that the alchemical process that every aspect of life can be seen in a way that opens to the depths, that we can open ourselves to the experience of living in an imaginal way. And that imaginal way of living, for me, makes a lot of sense of the world around us. It's not just a literal world, but an imaginal world. And uh, I think the COVID issue brings to light uh, a very powerful human struggle. Ok. Nossa amiga Daniela Lascani tem uma pergunta para fazer. Dani, contigo. Oi, Stanton. É muito bom ter você aqui, te ouvir. É, eu fiquei muito curiosa para saber quais são os objetos que você mais gosta da sua biblioteca, seu museu biblioteca. <laughs> yeah, it changes from day to day. Uh, I could take you for a walk around and look at stuff. But actually, the one that came to mind is, um, wow. well, there's so many. Um, uh, the one that came to mind was uh, when I was in New Orleans and uh, at a speaking with a, a voodoo priestess, uh, I ended up acquiring a, a large voodoo stick and um, very, very tall. And the idea is that when you hold it, it has a serpent coming up toward the head of the stick. And the idea was that when you tap it three times, it releases the spirits of the depths. And so that pull reminds me of that experience and is uh, one of the interesting objects that keeps attracting my attention. When I was uh, taking it home in a cab to the hotel, um, uh, when the doors to the car were open and the people who were opening the doors saw the voodoo stick, they stepped back about five paces 
and looked at it with a sense of, uh, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to go around with you there. <laughs> Yes, I, I would love to, uh, you know, show you around. It's amazing. There's uh, Mephisto. So lots of lots of fun things. Yeah, I think it's been a way of me holding on to certain life experiences, images powerful objects, evocative moments of life. And, uh, you know, so that's been part of living in this collection. Luciana Ximenez, tem uma pergunta. Oi, Stanton. Hum? É... Primeiro de tudo, queria dizer que adorei a tua palestra, adorei a sua fala. Fiquei super mexida com isso tudo. E eu queria pegar uma carona até no que o Marcos estava falando da, de como é que a gente enxerga, como é que você pode enxergar a pandemia, como é que pode ser uma imagem aí da alquimia na pandemia, pensando um pouco na cultura e na política. Eu não sei o quanto que você sabe do que da, da, da tristeza que a gente está vivendo aqui no Brasil com a política, né? mas acho que não é uma coisa só do Brasil, acho que é uma onda meio mundial de intolerância. né? E... E aí, é, esse olhar da escur na escuridão, né, com tanta desesperança que a gente tem aqui no, no Brasil e em outros lugares do mundo, é, eu queria saber se você tem alguma coisa para dizer sobre isso. Como é que a gente, com esse olhar de desesperança, pode conseguir olhar nessa escuridão? Sim. Sim, eu estou muito consciente what's going on in Brazil and a lot of similar things are going on here in the States. I think uh, the fundamentalism and the uh, power of uh, literalism and uh, distortion and horror uh, of our lives uh, is uh, very difficult. But I guess uh, from, again, the alchemical perspective, um, it is a kind of negredo experience. It is kind of uh, coming to terms with that hopelessness, uh, that kind of dying into the darkness of the times is an important part of what for me uh, is the beginning of something else. And that's a spark of light that lives in the midst of whatever darkness there is. So I guess you might say it's a kind of eternal hope that might have a level of naivete in it because I think it's important that you don't depend on that hope or light, that you have to be able to let go into the darkness in order to see something in and through it, that's something more. Um, so despair, uh, working with despair, working with depression, working with hopelessness, working with becoming a traveler along with your patient, not trying to rescue, not trying to simply reassure, not simply trying to make it better, not trying to simply be supportive, but standing with an entrance into the deepest parts of hopelessness is where I believe transformation potential exists. I think it's very hard for the analysts to do that. It's very hard for we as people to do it in our time. Stan, é, nós tivemos aqui no Tiaços o David Teis que nos apresentou uma visão é, do pensamento junguiano na Austrália de um modo muito negativo, no sentido de que, dentro da universidade, 
na Austrália, o pensamento, do Jung, o pensamento junguiano é visto quase como um anti-intelectualismo. Você também tem uma experiência dentro da universidade. Como você vê o, o Jung e o pensamento junguiano hoje dentro do, do cenário contemporâneo intelectual, universitário? Qual é, a tua, qual é a tua experiência, qual é a tua impressão? Pensamento junguiano e universidade. Como é que você pensa essa questão? Yeah. It's mixed. Um, I think that there is a lot of uh, uh, intellectualism, I think, of course, as I mentioned. Um, but I think there's a lot of really good people in academia, too. I think there are people who do work <coughs> and make contributions to Jungian thinking that are useful, that are challenging, that are vital. And I think there's a lot of misunderstanding Jung as usual, uh, translations of Jung that miss the depth uh, of the work. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I'm glad developing in universities. Um, I'm glad to see Jung being taken up and discussed and talked about. I think here at Duquesne, um, there's a lot of good Jungian work. I think some good Jungian work in Pacifica. A lot of places. Um, so for me, it's it's not one thing. It's not it's not mixed. It's not all. It's not all uh, lacking depth or lacking interest. Uh, but of course, there's a lot of misunderstandings. A lot of uh, intellectualizing that also goes on. But I don't see it all as one thing. I think it's person to person, school to school. Ok. Maíra tem uma pergunta. Está aí, Maíra? Oi, estou sim. É, achei muito especial, muito emocionante poder ouvir a fala dele. E eu queria perguntar a importância da morte do ego, como que a gente pode pensar e problematizar isso na psicologia junguiana, e qual é a relação que isso tem com o sol negro, e como a gente pode facilitar esse processo com os pacientes. É isso, obrigada. Sim. 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 I think the idea that I mentioned, the two, the two ideas that come to mind that amplify, there's a lot about, I think in a number of the papers I wrote, there's a lot about the death of the ego, whether the death is imagined as a negation process uh, like Wolfgang does, or whether the black sun is an image of the dying uh, Negredo and its implications, its illumination of that process. Uh, you know, the death of the ego, a victory for the self, for Jung, as I said. So it's a very important process of going down into the core of one's emptiness, like in Buddhism, or into the core of psyche, where there's a relativization of the ego, as Jung puts it that will and consciousness uh, uh, has to be relativized in order to be deepened. And so ultimately, uh, this idea of the victory for the self or the cure of me, as Hillman says, uh, getting over uh, the largely narcissistic quality of certain kinds of conscious life is important in the deepening process. And I think analytical work and working with the archetypal levels of psyche uh, help that process. It reiterates this process of death and rebirth. It's a fundamental archetype um, that the death experience is a transformative experience, relativization experience, an experience that changes 
the quality of life and soul, and that the work of analysis, when successful, helps people arrive at that as much as possible for them in their individual way. And so I think the Black Sun is one archetype of that process. And that analysts are trained, hopefully, to help a person go into that level of depth. Cláudia Gadotti, nossa amiga de São Paulo, também quer fazer uma pergunta agora. Cláudia, por favor. Oi, obrigada pela apresentação. Importante. É, na verdade, assim, o Rio Mundo fala para a gente que é uma. Ouvi? Ouvindo baixo. Bem baixo. Não está dando para ouvir? Melhor, melhor que o microfone. Ah, eu não posso Melhorou. tirar o microfone, tá bom. É, então, o Hillman fala que as nossas dores, que a nossa alma está aonde estão os nossos sofrimentos, nossas aflições. Então, a minha pergunta é a seguinte, nós estamos vivendo, como a Luciana falou, de muitas aflições, não só no Brasil, mas no cenário mundial de uma forma geral. Estamos vivendo um momento de é, regressão, de um sofrimento de, da alma mesmo. Né? Então, a gente poderia dizer que a gente está vivendo um momento mais anímico? Né? Nós estamos vivendo um momento de cultivo de alma, tal como o Rio colocou, né? já que nós estamos vivendo praticamente em Hades. Né? É isso. Obrigada. Yes, what was the word in this um, anemic? An, an, an it's a soul making. Is it a soul making? Is it a soul making moment? Since we is are living with a friction, suffering. Yeah. I think I think it is. Um, I think it can be. Maybe I should put it that way. Um, Because I, I think how we open ourselves to our experience is important in regard to soul making. <clears throat> There are ways of experiencing certain parts of life and trauma that destroy soul. And so how we live in relationship to the powerful experiences of life make a lot of difference. The capacity to live uh, in relationship to them, open to them, uh, and see into them and see through them is part of the soul-making process. But yes, I mean, I do think that this is the time when the opportunity for connecting with the depths is very powerful. Nina, faz a sua pergunta, por favor. Olá, boa tarde. Estão ouvindo? Ligou? Sim, sim. sim. Hum, eu gostaria agradecer mais uma vez e uh, eu gostaria de ouvi-lo falar um pouco sobre talvez uma contrapartida, então da mesma forma como foi colocado que a gente auxilia que os pacientes entrem nessa jornada, nessa confrontação com relação à, à sombra e todos os processos e o contrário, como entender a relação do paciente nos, 
não sei que verbo usar, nos estimulando, nos trazendo, nos fazendo com que a gente entre também na nossa, na nossa sombra e nos nossos processos. Né? Como que se dá a relação entre terapeuta e paciente, e paciente e terapeuta nesse processo de confrontação e mergulho numa análise? Hmm. Well, I, um, I'm not sure exactly. Um, I mean, you know, when I hear questions about analysis, of course, it brings up the whole question of how we do analysis and training to be analysts and how difficult it is to describe that process that we have. Um, and there's also a uniqueness to the process. There's not one way to do it. You know, I think uh, often uh, when I do supervision with people, it's not the right way or the wrong way. Um, it's there are ways of connecting and ways of supervising, ways of learning the analytic process. And that process might change uh, in the chemistry between two different people. Um, and so it's not a fixed system in my mind. We can do outlines of it and talk about it and learn about it, but it's not a formula uh, in my mind. It's a living experience of the development of a way of being and relating that helps the analytical process. The shadow is a very difficult part. Uh, I, I would point out an article I wrote for Murray Stein's book on Jungian psychoanalysis called Facing the Shadow. And there I talk about it, um, you know, in some depth. And um, I think it's a very important aspect of analytical work. And as an analyst, one has to be able also to tolerate some of the shadow material that people bring in. Otherwise, it's very hard to work with uh, because um, uh, as Jung said, when we do analysis, we're also in analysis. And to be able to go down into our own depths in order to engage with the depths of another person. So there's a chemistry there. And in order to help a person we have to be able to work out and work through the things that get catalyzed in us in order to relate in a way that's not defensive or uh, uh, that can fully open to try to understand and not solve it for a person, but to help them come to their own understanding of what's going on in their depths as you understand your own. So something like that. I'm not sure whether that answers your question or not, but that's what comes to mind. Obrigado, Stan. Patrícia Eugênio, querida amiga de São Paulo. Patrícia, por favor. Estão me ouvindo? Sim, sim. Tá. Stan, obrigada pela sua fala muito bacana, já escrevi um trabalho sobre a Negredo e usei muito do seu material. É, o Rio mantém uma fala que há algo em hum. nós que não pode ser aceito, não pode ser mudado e que não desaparece. Eu entendo que essa foi a forma do Hillman definir o seu inassimilável. Como identificar na alma o que é de fato inassimilável ou é uma resistência a algo que eu não quero mudar? Aonde está o limite entre o possível e o impossível frente a, a, ao inassimilável? Sim. Yes. Well, I think there are parts of the shadow that are archetypal and can't be assimilated. They can be related to, 
There are also things that human beings may not be able to <laughs> accept. And sometimes Jung says something about um, some things are not so much worked through or worked out, but come to form part of our character and are simply lived beyond. We have to live forward and we don't necessarily solve everything, but they become marks of who we are as individuals. So that it's not so much that we create in individuation a perfect person, but that we become ourselves and we're marked by all the things that we do and do not, can and cannot accept in ourselves. And we do our best to turn toward it, to take in all that we can, and then we have limitations. So I don't know that there's ever a perfect analysis or a perfect individuation or a perfect self, that perfect itself is an ontological fantasy and individuation and development is uh, uh, becoming a whole human being, which doesn't mean perfection. Obrigada. Stan, uh, você acha que o Jung dos últimos anos, dos anos 30 em diante, o Jung alquímico, por assim dizer, mais do que o Jung do símbolos de transformação, tipos psicológicos, resposta a Jó, o Jung alquímico é o apogeu, o ápice daquilo que a gente poderia chamar de um certo espírito da obra junguiana? Quer dizer, os últimos anos do Jung, os anos alquímicos, é ali onde efetivamente reside o coração, né? o calor, o fogo do pensamento junguiano? Sim. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was for young alchemy that helped him organize and put all of his original experiences, primordial experiences of the Red Book into some kind of frame. And he did try to theorize and wrote about it. And I do think there the later young really um you know moves him into a place that is in a, a very rich heritage for us. But in another way, you know, a lifetime of work is a corpus. Um, you know, uh, I, I think that, you know, I, I like to read all of Jung that I can. I like to read the early stuff. I like to read the late stuff. But I think I'm certainly more attracted to um, uh, Jung's later work, uh, I find it uh, more compelling. Uh, um, I like reading Memory Streams Reflections, as I mentioned, the late thoughts and late reflections uh, and his alchemical thinking, uh, the Mysterium Canuntionis. Um, I think one can trace back from the late works understandings and different understandings of the whole corpus. So I'm, I'm certainly drawn to the latter part of Jung's work for the vitality and for the fire. And a lot of the work, as, as he said, you know, was his attempt to try to put these amazing archetypal experiences into some kind of language that he felt was an ethical contribution to our time. And that was his attempt to put and write theoretical works with which uh, Stoner, for instance, says a little bit differently than Hillman, has some value in helping modulate some of that work for people. But the primordial power of the work, I think, comes in ways of expressing it that are less scientific and theoretical and more poetic. So I like the poetic part and the primordial part of Jung 
the archetypal part I lean toward. Um, uh, so it's a personal, it's just a personal statement. A gente tem uma pergunta do Ricardo. Ricardo, você escreveu aqui? Você quer falar? É... Ricardo, você está aí? Não é ele que está com problema no som? Acho que talvez seja melhor ver se ele consegue localizar. Mas ele não mandou escrito. Ah, não. Bom. É... Stan... É, vamos, vamos encerrar por aqui, a gente já está na nossa hora, eu queria te agradecer muito a tua, a tua disponibilidade tua generosidade e sua amabilidade em receber o nosso convite em dispor do seu tempo para estabelecer essa troca, tenha certeza que para todos nós aqui do Brasil do Tiaços, o nosso grupo, foi uma oportunidade muito especial poder te ouvir, poder pensar com você, e espero que isso também tenha repercutido da mesma maneira contigo. Deixo para você as últimas palavras para encerrar esse nosso encontro. Muito obrigado. Well, thank you. It's been an honor for me to talk with you and uh, very enjoyable and stimulating and I appreciate the questions and the interest and uh, it's stimulating to me. I learn a great deal when I have people who raise such powerful and interesting questions. So thank you. And thank you for the invitation. Eu que te agradeço. Obrigado mesmo. Até a próxima. Para uma próxima okay, oportunidade. Bye. bye bye. Pessoal, okay. obrigado por todos que vieram. Bye bye. Pela presença. É, tivemos mais um encontro do Tiaços. Fica o convite, então, agora, para o próximo sábado, dia 8, às 4 horas. Nossa próxima convidada será a Patrícia Berry. Então, obrigado novamente pela presença, obrigado pelas perguntas, espero que vocês tenham gostado. É, no nosso grupo do, desse encontro tem vários textos, aliás, eu diria que tem quase todos os textos que o Stanton mencionou aqui, eles estão lá no como documentos no nosso grupo de WhatsApp. Por favor, peguem os textos, imprimam, leiam, e fica o meu agradecimento a todos. Tá bem? Até a próxima, então. Obrigado. Até lá. Ah, agradecendo ao Luciano Chimenez, claro, companheira, é, inestimável carinho, atenção e dedicação, sem o qual nenhum desses eventos do Teatro seria possível. Muito obrigado. Isa, obrigado também pela tradução. Imagino que... Você... <risos> Hercúlia, né? uma tarefa alquímica, né? uma tra travessia do, do, da Negredo, mas parabéns, <risos> obrigado pela, pela tua gentileza também e pela paciência, tá? Tudo de bom, Isa. Obrigado, pessoal, até lá.